<laughs> My name is Kathy Britton. I'm going to be your moderator for this conference. I am the uh, Executive Director of the Telehealth Alliance of Oregon. Uh, a couple things we want to tell you in terms of instructions for this, this conference or this section of the conference is that the audio and the video are muted for all participants. So we cannot see you and hear you, but you can see and hear us. Uh, if you want to uh, post a question, to the presenter, you can use the Q&A feature. And following her presentation, I will present those questions to her and you can get your answers. Um, the presentation slides will also be posted on the NRTRC website at the following link. And shortly thereafter, you'll be able to access the recordings. Today, this section's presenter is Dr. Dale Langford. Uh, she is a research assistant professor at the University of Washington. Uh, she has a uh, probably the longest topic <laughs> title for her presentation that we have, but uh, it's also, I think, really interesting and one that um, I'm excited to hear about because when their telepain program started, many years ago, uh, I had the uh, opportunity to uh, be a, a, an observer in that, and it was just an incredible program. And so she's going to present some information that uh, talks about uh, provider, or excuse me, uh, patient experience. Um, the entire title, entire title is called Challenges and Potential Solution we're evaluating the patient experience after provider-to-provider -provider telehealth consultation or pain management. And at this, that point, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dale, and let you go ahead and uh, present your, your uh, material. Thank you, Kathy. Okay. Here we go. Can you see that okay? Perfect. All right. Okay. Well, thank you for the introduction and apologies for the mouthful of a title. Um, I very much appreciate the opportunity to be uh, quote unquote here with you guys today. So as Kathy said, I am a research assistant professor in the Division of Pain Medicine at the University of Washington. One of my roles um, is to facilitate outcomes collection from our telepain program. So I will tell you a bit about what that is as we go forward. Oh, and I am also having trouble advancing the slides, but let me see if I can think of another way. Okay. Um, so what I hope you take away from this uh, presentation is really an understanding of the need for and the potential value of a chronic pain telementoring program. Um, understanding of the need for and the challenges of evaluating patient outcomes in particular as a result of this provider to provider pain telementoring program. And that this possibility of disseminating a patient reported outcomes tool to providers might facilitate one, their engagement in telementoring, um, their support, their ability to offer and provide measurement based pain care. Um, and then, of course, uh, give us the kind of data that we need to really measure the impact of telepain on patient outcomes. So this is just a broad overview of what I'll talk about today. So first, the significance of chronic pain, the associated opioid epidemic, um, and the University of Washington's telepain program as a response to a regional health crisis. Um, I'll then talk about how we have been gauging the impact of pain telementoring, both at the provider level and the patient level, some challenges in particular of capturing those patient outcomes, and then a potential solution that we are developing and um, hoping to implement this spring or summer for our community of telepain providers. So pain is in highly prevalent. It is the most common reason uh, that patients seek medical care. It has been estimated to affect more than 100 million people in the United States, and it carries with it the greatest global burden of disease. So the top four chronic pain conditions, chronic back pain, chronic neck pain, migraines, um, other musculoskeletal disorders, really um, are 
four of the top 10 um, conditions globally in developing and developed countries um, that cause the greatest disability. And the estimated cost of chronic pain is exorbitant. Up to $635 billion per year is estimated to be spent on pain in terms of healthcare costs, wages lost due to missed work, et cetera. And as you all know, we have been in the midst of an opioid epidemic. Um, prescription opioid misuse, addiction, overdose deaths have really been on the rise over the last several decades. This plot in particular shows uh, overdose deaths in the US from prescription opioids from 1999 through 2018. You see, of course, this significant increase, but also a plateau and perhaps even a sign that we're moving in the right direction. But at the same time as we're experiencing this opioid epidemic um, and probably fueled in part is this dual epidemic or concurrent epidemic of inadequate pain management. Um, and this can really happen for a number of reasons. Pain is complex, it's multidimensional, and so it requires a multidimensional treatment approach. Pain is conceptualized as a symptom of disease rather than a disease in and of itself. And so it lacks the um, attention and training that other health conditions might. And there's an acknowledgement globally that pain education is really limited and it's inadequate across health science curricula um, as health science disciplines at the pre-licensure level and beyond. Um, and really, once you're out in the community and practicing, there may be a, a lack of resources and or the lack or limited access to pain specialists for consultation for patients with complex chronic pain. And primary care providers really bear the brunt of this burden. So they provide the vast majority of chronic pain care while they're in a unique position to offer quality pain care because they've built this relationship with these patients, they may see the onset of pain, the development of pain and how it's impacting different parts of their life. They may also be isolated in their practice, um, either geographically or being in an underserved um, or resource poor area with limited or delayed access to pain specialist consultation. And that has been acknowledged as a regional um, health crisis. So University of Washington's, I'll refer to it as UW from now on, uh, telepain program was really created in response to this challenge. It's primarily targets community clinicians, so primary care providers in Washington state, but also throughout what we call the Whammy region. So Washington, Wyoming, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho. But we do have reaches into Oregon, across the country, and in, even up in Canada. We're in front of, if you haven't already noticed from my abouts. Um, and we are currently funded by the Washington State Healthcare Authority. So University of Washington Telepain really follows that the ECHO model. What we aim to do is connect primary care providers in the community with a panel of multidisciplinary pain management experts. Um, and what we hope is that we're encouraging providers to learn with each other, from each other. It builds this knowledge network with the multiplier effect multiplier effect, meaning that there is this rapid diffusion of knowledge from the expert panel to the group of community um, providers who bring that back to their community, can disseminate that knowledge both to their colleagues and to their patients. Um, we, of course, use a video teleconferencing modality um, to meet weekly. This bridges geographic distances, of course, um, and really allows the primary care providers to manage complex chronic pain in their own community with mitigating the need for patient travel, et cetera. And the overall objective of the program is really to improve community providers' capacity to deliver safe, compassionate, measurement and evidence-based care for their patients with chronic pain. Uh, so the telepain program started in March of 2011, so we're coming up closely on 10 years. Um, since then, uh, telepain's provided more than 15,000 hours of education and consultation to well over 1,300 learners um, from 300 unique and diverse locations. And we currently have an average of about 30 providers per weekly session, although we've noticed an uptick um, during our current um, COVID-19 pandemic. So with the format of telepain, it's really divided into two components. There's 30 minutes for a didactic um, session it's a lecture given on a specific pain topic by a content expert. Those topics might include 
do include establishing a pain diagnosis, multidimensional outcome tracking, which is particularly relevant to this presentation, opioid prescribing, addiction assessment and treatment, and many others. And these presentations are given either by someone on that expert panel or invited speakers, depending on the topic. And then after that presentation, there's time for Q&A, and then 60 minutes are devoted um, to case presentations from community providers. So they'll submit a request to present a case at Telepain. They'll go through some um, demographic and treatment related characteristics of the patient, and then there'll be a discussion with the panel. After they present, they're sent written recommendations uh, from the panel, consolidated into an email, and they're encouraged to present a follow-up presentation. The important question that we have to ask that our sponsor asks is, is it effective? And how do we gauge the impact of telepain? Are we concerned about how the provider perceives telepain? Are we more concerned about how, it's, how it is impacting the patient? So what do we measure? What's the appropriate outcome? Is it that the provider perceives they're more competent, that they're satisfied? Is it changes in their prescription behaviors or referral patterns? Or is it the patient reported outcomes, how the patient's pain is improving or not improving? Mood, changes in mood, sleep, function. Um, and how do we collect those data? We can ask the provider, um, which sim seems in theory simple, and it's a provider-facing intervention, so it makes sense. Um, we can mine uh, prescription databases if we are interested in opioid uh, prescriptions. That also presents its own difficulties. And we can ask the patient. Um, but as you'll see uh, later in the presentation, this, that can be challenging in and of itself. So as part of our own QI, we have asked the provider several questions. So in our quarterly evaluations, we ask about their perceived competence using this perceived competence scale, which can be modified for any educational uh, topic. And the providers do agree that their uh, perceived competence in managing uh, chronic pain has improved as a result of telepain, which is great. We also ask them um, whether telepain has met state, its stated activity objectives, whether it's provided new ideas, address competencies, the usual um, evaluation questions, and also part of the CME process. And we see that the vast majority of providers note that it's had a positive impact um, on their practice and their knowledge. We also ask, we also ask providers to report um, one intended change that they intend to implement as a result of participating in telepain. So this is um, just a word cloud graphic. So the size of the font indicates a greater frequency um, of or a greater number of, pay, of providers who, who um, endorse that change. Um, and what's great to see here is that we're really covering established core competencies in pain management, management from the multidisciplinary, um, multi pain as a multidisciplinary phenomenon, the management of pain, assessment um, of pain, and, and um, managing pain in particular contexts. So we do know from um, our own uh, quality improvement processes that it seems to be effective um, for providers in terms of their competence and knowledge. But we did want to go a little bit more in depth, and so we asked the providers to meet with us to do semi-structured interviews over the phone um, and ask them some questions about telepain has, has, how telepain has impacted their care. Um, what we did find is that there was an increase in the use of best practices in terms of their management of patients with chronic pain. So they were more likely to be calculating morphine equivalent dosages, to be screening for sleep apnea, to be screening for depression directly as a result of the content that they learned at telepain. They all endorsed increased knowledge and or confidence, but also with that, um, the challenges of implementing this newfound knowledge because of a lack of, of resources in their area. I found that this term was used by, by all four providers who we spoke uh, to, the term backup. So it's really, Telepain was a support system, a non-judgmental group of peers who could provide uh, them with recommendations, with resources, and with the confidence to go back and manage patients with complex chronic pain. And they also used it as a reinforcing tool for their more difficult patients who um, may be more unwilling to change or accept a recommendation. They could blame it, blame it on the bad guys at Telepain. 
Um, they also noted, and interestingly, just the, the very fact of preparing a case for telepain allowed them to do this comprehensive assessment of their patient that they might not have had time to do previously. And so in, in so doing, um, identified some unexplored avenues of multimodal treatment. And of course, in gaining a better understanding of chronic pain, they're also better able to explain pain to their patients. So this is all a result of our own QI practices and, and looking to see whether telepain itself um, was effective for our providers. But there's also a lot of evidence in the literature to suggest that pain management telementoring is effective and it has been measured in a number of ways. So provider reported outcomes and behaviors, prescribing practices, these are by far the most, um, the most common, and they note similar changes as, as what I have uh, just described to you. In terms of prescribing practices, um, there's a reduction in the number and dose of opioid prescriptions per patient, reduction proportion of patients treated with an opioid, increased use of non-opioid pain medications, and then um, two uh, findings that I'll talk about in a little bit more detail um, is that a greater proportion of patients discontinue long-term opioid therapy, and there's a greater reduction in opioid dosages among actively participating providers, um, providers who participated in pain telementoring. What we're really lacking is um, evidence of changes in patient-reported outcomes, and there's, again, a number of, of challenges that go along with that. So there are some unpublished data that suggest uh, that patients experience improved quality of life um, if they're for the providers presented their case at telepain and a reduced pain interference uh, with work. One commonality across several of these studies is really this importance of active engagement. So the providers really have to participate in telepain, either by presenting a case or attending a certain number of um, a certain number of sessions to really acquire this knowledge and apply it to their patients. So I wanted to uh, share with you this exemplar study that really demonstrates the value of pain telementoring at the patient level because we are looking at within patient changes in opioid prescription for patients who are on long-term opioid therapy when their providers entered a study of pain telementoring. And this was a combo echo uh, telepain with providers uh, from Madigan Army Medical Center. It also shows the importance of engagement in telementoring and gives us some evidence of this multiplier effect that I mentioned before. So these data come from Madigan's local opioid database of patients on long-term opioid therapy. The data we get from there are the average opioid dosage per day for each calendar month. Um, and it includes data from patients impaneled to 13 control group providers, so providers who did not participate in pain telementoring, and 12 intervention providers, so providers who did have the opportunity to participate in pain telementoring. And they were included in this study if they had at least one patient on long-term opioid therapy upon study enrollment. The patients were any patient impaneled to study provider who was on LOT when their provider enrolled in the study. So this ended up being out close to 400 patients. And the outcomes that we were interested in were changes in morphine equivalent daily dosages um, and discontinuation of long-term opioid therapy within the study period or um, within the time, uh, within the, the duration of their uh, patient and provider relationship. So we used uh, generalized estimating equations um, to look at changes in MED from baseline to end of study and proportion of patients who discontinued LOT during the study period between the control and the intervention groups. We clustered on the provider because there are different numbers of, there are a number of patients per provider, and we controlled for baseline uh, opioid dosages. And we did this in two ways, an intent to treat analysis where we simply compared the control group to the intervention group, regardless of participation in pain telementoring, but we did note this huge variability in terms of the level of participation. So in the as-treated analysis, we subdivided the intervention group into actively participating providers and low to no participating providers. 
This table simply shows uh, provider characteristics and that there were no significant differences in terms of demographic characteristics or baseline prescribing um, between the control and intervention group. While we saw a reduction in opioid dosages in both the control and intervention groups, which is great, there was not a statistically significant difference between um, the two groups. However, we did see that a higher proportion of patients who were impaneled to intervention group participants discontinued long-term opioid therapy altogether, an estimated 25% uh, versus 16% of the control um, groups panel. When we did this as treated analysis, we found that those providers who actively participated, so who attended at least 15 um, telepain echo sessions, um, really were able to reduce the opioid dosages significantly compared to those who did not participate or really had low levels of participation in telepain. Um, we also saw that the actively participating providers had a greater proportion of patients who discontinued LOT compared to the control group where participating providers did not. So we see from this study that telepain, pain telemetering can have a, an, an important impact at the patient level. We also see the importance of having uh, providers really be actively engaged in the program. But all this is well and good, um, but we really do also want to know about the patient experience and how the patient perceives their care to be changing, their function, their pain, their quality of life. Um, one thing that we have started doing is semi-structured interviews with a subset of patients. So we asked our providers who had presented a case at Telepain to refer us a patient um, that we could speak to who might be willing to participate in these. Uh, we were able to talk with five patients, six were referred, and they were all referred, I should note, ahead of time uh, by a few of our more engaged providers. So we did uh, note about five themes here. So there's improvements in activities or function. Patients were returning to valued activities like cooking, gardening, spending time with the grandkids. Um, there were changes in their patient-provider interactions. There's this perception that the providers were really willing to go out of their way to help, um, to provide as frequent care as needed, educate, be honest and trustworthy, um, and really be approachable and that patients could have difficult conversations with them if need be. They also noted a sense of uh, hope that they and their providers were um, making good strides towards a positive impact. Um, and they not they, although they did not always attribute that to their provider's presentation of their case at, at Telepain. They also indicated that they were seeking out with their provider multiple modalities of treatment, um, including care from specialists, so behavioral health, psychiatry, a migraine, physical therapy, et cetera. And across the board, uh, they noted a reduction in their ability to reduce their pain medications, particularly opioids. Again, this is from a subset of patients from more actively engaged providers. So it's not necessarily um, a generalizable picture of how we're impacting patients. And really the major challenge to collecting patient reported outcomes that we found is that this is provider facing service, a provider facing education. Um, so it's really challenging to engage the patient who's kind of on the other end of things. We don't have a relationship with the patients, and so we really have to rely on busy primary care providers um, to be um, our connection to them. Patients may not always be aware that their case is being presented at Telepain as well, and we would never want to, to blindside anyone um, with, uh, with contact for patient reported outcomes they are not expecting. And even in the context of a research project, um, we mentioned before, there's some unpublished data to suggest some improvements in quality of life um, and pain interference. Engagement of those patients, even in the context of a study, proved difficult and loss to follow up was common. And even sometimes the patient reported outcome assessment, assessment could not be aligned with clinical care. So they may have answered these questions prior to even having the opportunity to implement some of the recommendations from the panel. And then if we restrict 
our evaluation to only those patients whose cases are presented at telepain, we really overlook and miss entirely this multiplier effect. Um, and in so doing, we're reducing the power to observe meaningful changes by limiting the sample size to only those patients. So finally, getting to our potential solution, what really, we're really working towards is to adapt um, an existing web-based multi-dimensional patient reported outcomes tool called Pain Tracker um, for our providers who present cases at Telepain. So this tool is currently used at University of Washington Center for Pain Relief uh, to support patient-centered assessment and the management of chronic pain. It includes a number of constructs, which I'll get into on the next slide. But really, the goals of adapting Pain Tracker for a telepain community are multifold. We think that it will be a valuable clinical tool that will support providers in their care of patients with, uh, with chronic pain and will actually also serve to engage and empower patients to be able to monitor their symptoms um, and facilitate discussion with their provider about how they're doing. We also hope that it will incentivize provider engagement. So initial access to paint the pain tracker system um, will be contingent on them presenting a case at telepain. We also um, believe that it will facilitate telepain consultation by providing clinically actionable data in a digestible form. And I'll show you what we are, are hoping to make our draft report look like in an upcoming slide. And then of course, it will allow us to kind of seamlessly collect these outcome data on patients of providers who present cases at telepain. Not only those cases who are presented, but the provider will be able to use this with all patients on their panel. So these are the constructs that are measured uh, by pain tracker. We currently uh, have a little bit more of a comprehensive um, tool and we're looking to streamline this and make it a little bit more adaptive so that we can minimize patient burden um, and really more efficiently um, monitor multi-dimensions of pain. So there are some risk stratification measures that are administered at baseline only at intake, um, so the screening for fibromyalgia, for sleep apnea, for substance misuse, um, and then some patient reported health status items that are measured at baseline. And then what we will do is auto-generate some requ a request to complete pain tracker at uh, three month intervals or at the um, schedule of, of, that the provider chooses. Uh, these will be treatment goals and expectations that the patients will rank from a, a drop-down list, pain intensity and interference with enjoyment of life and general activity, which is the PEG, um, a difficulty with the patient specified activity that they'll monitor throughout treatment, pain interference with sleep, uh, distress, treatment satisfaction, and then the immediate next step that they would like to do with their provider. If the scores on these items are above um, an established threshold, that will trigger a more detailed measure so that we can get a little bit more information um, about how they're doing. This is what a current uh, pain tracker longitudinal report looks like that we use at the Center for Pain Relief. So in the upper left, we see that providers are alerted when the patient's um, risk or their symptom severity scores exceed an established cutoff. You can see that by the little uh, caution symbols. Um, and so it will support, the idea is to support clinical decisions that um, address key patient problems. There's an interactive body diagram. The patient fills out pain tracker. They actually click on the different parts of the body. And then this, in addition to some supplemental questionnaires, can aid in the uh, diagnosis of certain pain conditions like fibromyalgia. In the top right, um, it lists the patient goals and expectations. So really trying to prioritize those and keep those fresh in providers' minds. And then what's great about this report is if you have longitudinal data, you can graphically see areas of improvement as well as areas that um, of continued difficulty and so that you can tailor treatment um, accordingly. Okay, I think I went too fast there, one second. Um, so this is the, the intake report that we are working towards. We know that when patients are presented at telepain, they've really, they've only um, reported on their symptoms 
once we hear this from the provider at telepain. So what we would like to do is have these patients if they're having their case presented at telepain, complete this intake pain tracker assessment and have this come up on the screen when the provider presents their case at telepain. So this report, we would like to kind of bookend the report by really emphasizing the patient-specified their goals, their expectations, the activity that's really important to them that they're finding they have difficulty with, and then ending with really their, what they want their next step to be with their primary care provider. It'll have a section for the risk screeners um, with clear statements about what being high risk means and, um, um, and any, any um, item, any outcome that exceeds this threshold will again be uh, have a caution symbol aside from it. What we plan to do in terms of its development is really make it an interactive report so that pay providers can hover over those caution symbols to learn more, to learn what it means to be high risk, to learn about different treatment options because they're high risk for something or because they exceed um, a threshold for a certain symptom. Um, we're also going to have an option to output an interpretive summary that will help guide their clinical care in complement to what they receive from telepain consultation. And we'll devote one of our telepain didacts, didactics to the use and interpretation of pain tracker. Um, so we'll modify the multidimensional outcome tracking didactic to include specific use of pain tracker. And then we really feel that the use of this kind of report will facilitate discussion during the case consultation and kind of act as an educational tool for the broader telepain community who are calling in so they can follow along with the panel and with the presenting provider um, to learn how to conduct these multidimensional pain assessments, even if they're not using pain tracker. So this is probably more detail than you need, but this is what our workflow is, is looking like. So the provider will submit a request for telepain consultation. They'll receive a unique pain login information and step-by-step -step instructions for how they will set it up. They'll have access to a provider-facing dashboard um, so that they can see their patients on, on, their, on their screen. The patient will receive a separate unique link for their um, completion of the intake pain tracker assessment. And then after presentation, the pain tracker will be accessible for all patients, all of the provider's patients um, for one year until the end of our, our HCA contract. Um, and then we'll generate um, automatically requests to the patients to report on their symptoms in follow-up pain tracker assessments um, every three months. And this can be modified. So if the provider wants those to be timed immediately before um, or after a, um, a clinic visit, that will be possible as well. And then we'll look at a number of different metrics in terms of feasibility and usability or uptake of pain tracker, like the proportion of patients who successfully complete it, the number of providers, and particularly the number of new providers who are requesting case consultations, and then of course, uh, ratings of utility and satisfaction from the providers. And then the end goal as well is to collect these multidimensional patient reported pain and outcomes, um, both at intake and over time, and both for patients who are presented at telepain, as well as for all patients on a provider's panel who may be suffering from chronic pain. So to summarize, we think the benefits of providing a web-based PRO tool in complement to our telepain program will really support the providers. It will facilitate measurement-based patient-centered chronic care, pain care that we um, that is spoken of so often during telepain sessions. It will provide an opportunity for patient empowerment and then they in that they can track their symptoms um, and speak that about their with speak about their symptoms with their provider more effectively. We think it will incentivize engagement in telepain, which we know to be a really key factor in the improvement of outcomes. Um, we think it will improve the telepain case consultation experience and really act as this educational tool for the audience. And then of course, will allow for some um, seamless collection of patient reported outcome data. So I thought about this and how this might be relevant to other telehealth initiatives. Um, I know this is a different sort of program than, than uh, others that are being discussed today. And so I, I'm honored that we're, we're um, one of those efforts and initiatives.
Um, I guess what I would say is to consider supplemental web-based tools that support the patient or the provider and complement to telehealth, uh, web-based tools that might promote engagement or application of knowledge, and that provide data for quality improvement purposes or research purposes. So with that, I would like to acknowledge our um, fearless leader, medical director, trio leader from the start, Dr. David Talvin, um, Dr. Mark Sullivan, who is our assistant director of telepain and also very much involved in adapting pain tracker for primary care, Dr. Bill Lober and Justin McReynolds, who are um, part of our clinical informatics research group, who are actually working now to make this happen so that we can implement shortly and Dr. Artie Durham-Boss and Dr. Diane Flynn, who are my collaborators. Um, Artie was at UW for many years. She's now at University of Illinois at Chicago, um, but she um, had an R01 to study uh, patient and provider outcomes of telepain. Dr. Diane Flynn is our collaborator at Madigan Army Medical Center, who we worked with um, on the telepain ECHO project. And of course, the rest of the panel um, of telepain at UW and our sponsor, Washington State Healthcare Authority. Um, and with that, I'll say thank you. If you have any questions that we don't get to here, please feel free to reach out to me directly if you have questions about cell pain in general or want to learn more. There's also um, the web address right here. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Really appreciate that presentation. And I, I do think that, you know, despite some of the things that we're trying to deal with right now, that we're going to be dealing with an uptick of, of uh, opioid use, if not during the, the pandemic, at least immediately following it. Um, and I, I, um, I think this is really a, a appropriate for uh, what we're doing. Um, audience, do you have any questions for Dana? Well, I have a couple while you're typing those in. Um, do you think that you will have a report that, it, that it's published um, and that is available to folks who, who might be interested in doing something similar? Yes. Do you mean from studies that have, that were you, are you referring to the unpublished data that I was speaking of? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> those, are, those are being written up as we speak. So I didn't go into too much detail, but yes, those should be available shortly. I think the interesting, the interesting finding is that, so the opioid, the, they were able to reduce opioids, reduce constipation. There didn't seem to be a significant impact on, on pain intensity per se, but it seems the, the impact of pain, so pain interference and quality of life seem to improve among uh, patients who, whose providers did participate in telepain. But again, with, with that study, with the telepain study, there's wide variation in terms of how much partic uh, providers participated. Um, and so we haven't investigated sort of the dose of the intervention there. So that's, that's something that we might do. Okay. <laughs> The, the other thing that I, I, I'm interested in is the, the, that you have um, t two points of engagement, one, one with your providers and then one with the provider's patients. Um, what do you think is the biggest stumbling block to provider engagement? I, I know you provide CMEs if they participate. So what, what seems to be the biggest stumbling block to uh, engaging them to participate in a program like this? I think, I think everyone who has participated finds it very useful and valuable. I know that there are providers um, who have difficulty just attending. It's, it's every Wednesday midday for an hour and a half, and that's not an easy thing to carve out. Um, so I do believe that people who, who try it find it useful um, and bring that back to their patients, but I think that that would probably be the largest, um, the largest hurdle. And okay. I will say too, um, in the study that I, that I talked about is long-term opioid therapy, 
um, and where we notice the different levels of engagement and activity and analyze based on that. Those providers who actively participated had buy-in from leadership. So they had time carved out of their schedule, their attendance was monitored. And so I think if we, if we can designate those pain champions, um, we might have some better success and give them the time to really come and engage themselves. Okay, thank you. Um, I, Mark, is, it, is that your note in the Q&A? I saw that and uh, I'm having no issues on my end. I think it's okay. I'm not having any issues either, but I did pick up my phone because people told me I kind of fade out uh, so hopefully that will resolve some of the problem uh, that we're having. Um, and, and my final question to you is, if this is, seems to be, I mean, you've been doing this for a, almost 10 years now. Um, it's been successful in terms of using an echo type model. And, but you've had to scramble for funding or your pro whole program has had to scramble for funding. Um, do you feel that there should be a mechanism to uh, fund pr uh, programs who are using echo type models and, uh, and also the, the subsequent research that would be required to see if they're effective? Yes, yes. And that's, uh, so we've been funded for the last, we're approaching three years um, by the state. So we're a line item in the government budget, um, which is wonderful. And I think that that's how it should be going forward. But I, I know that after, after the dust clears, there might be mm -hmm. some funding drying, <laughs> drying up. Um, <laughs> but yes, I, I, absolutely, I absolutely think that there should, be, there should be money there for both to run the sessions and then to do the research on top of that. And the research is, is, is a challenge. Great. Well, this has been a wonderful presentation and I wanna thank you for taking the time to do this. Um, I know that you have a busy schedule and you also have a busy household. And uh, so I appreciate you doing this for us. And if you all who are in the audience have any questions, uh, for Dana, you can certainly submit them and we'll try to make sure that they get answered. So um, and with that being said, I'm going to close the session and thank you again, Dana. Thank you for having me.